As you know, I teach at Florida Christian College, and uh, I do not, when I come on weekends like this or whatever the time frame is, I do not uh, spend a lot of time promoting the college because that's not why I'm here. But I just want to bring you greetings from Florida where it is now warm and sunny and the flowers are growing. And where I shall be uh, tomorrow about noon, I really hate to leave this ice and snow and uh, cold wind. Well, I don't hate to leave that at all. We in Florida, as we've been there a few years, we take cold weather personally. It's kind of like an insult. But I uh, am going to, to be sorry to leave you all. It's been great to be with you. I'm honored that you would ask me to participate in this uh, weekend. <clears throat> it's always a real joy to be with Tom and Fran and the family. They're great people and uh, good friends. You're fortunate to have them as your leaders here. And um, I look forward to great things in the future. You can always tell, and, and this is, uh, every preacher knows this. Do you notice how bad Tom is at making announcements? He really stinks when it, when it, when it comes to making announcements. Um, I was always terrible, Tom. It was a joke at Westside, where I preached for so many years, how bad I was. If they wanted announcements made right, they made them themselves. But you need to know, Tom, this is what you and I need to know this, that, the better, that there's a rule, it's written down somewhere, that the better a preacher is, the worse he is at making announcements. Only lousy preachers make good announcements. So I just thought I'd tell you that. Feel better? Romans 8. <clears throat> Romans 8. I want to teach verses 14 through 17 in particular. I'm going to read a couple of those verses, and then we're going to look at the background and try to come upon and deliver what Paul had in mind when he wrote these words. Romans 8:14 For all who are led who are being led by the spirit of God these are sons of God For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out Abba Father Now <clears throat> somebody has said a very fine scholar has said that if we compare uh, the Bible to a ring that a person would put on his or her hand that the book of Romans would be the gemstone on the ring. And the eighth chapter of Romans would be the sparkle on the gem. Now whether that will hold true or not, that certainly speaks accurately of the role of the place that, that the book of Romans holds in, uh, in Christianity. I could lecture for several hours about the specific role it has played in the history of the church, negatively and positively for the good or for the bad. But I want to build upon some of the foundation I laid Friday night when I preached on Abrahamic faith. I, as you recall, I did some teaching from the fourth chapter of Romans. And so I'm going to say a couple of things that I said uh, in, by way of introduction. Most of you were here. Some of you could not be here Friday night. But let me repeat that the book of Romans is about fellowship. It's written to restore the fellowship in the church at Rome. The Jewish Christians were not accepting the Gentile Christians, and the Gentile Christians were not accepting the Jewish Christians. The point or message of the book of Romans is, accept one another. The argument given is that there is no distinction. The Jews are not better than the Gentiles, nor the Gentiles better than the Jews. And Paul, uh, as I pointed out Friday night, he goes through systematically and answers every reason given by the Jews for not accepting the Gentiles. We are of Abraham, they're not. We had the law, they didn't. We had the covenant, they didn't. We had the promises, they didn't. We had the fathers, they didn't. And then he answers the objections raised by the Gentiles against their brothers. And they're the brothers they would not accept, that the Israel has been cast off, and, and since the nation has rejected uh, its Messiah, then individual Jews are therefore second-rate Christians. And Paul says that's not true. There is no distinction. Now, Romans chapter 8 fits into it in this way. It starts out, there is, not, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You got that? That's, what, uh, that's a magnificent uh, statement, isn't it? 
And we hear that, we're glad, aren't we? We are sinners, and we are glad that if we are in Christ Jesus, if we have obeyed the gospel, that there is no condemnation from God. Now, his ultimate point, tune me in, his ultimate point, now you'll forgive me, by the way, if I keep saying things like that, but see, I'm a professional teacher, and I, I'm used to teaching students at 7 in the morning who are, half, who are, who are uh, uh, in a coma, and um, so I have to furnish um, most of the energy in the class and um, do all the speaking and some of the listening. Well, anyway, so when I say tune in, that's important. You're supposed to take notes. Um, I'd hate for you to flunk this revival. Uh, when he says, there is, that, there is now therefore no condemnation, he is making a point, and the point is this, and I'm summarizing and taking all kinds of shortcuts for sake of time. His point is, because there is no condemnation from God to any of the Roman Christians, Jew or Gentile, since God condemns neither if they're in Christ and because they're in Christ, they must not condemn one another. Now, we're going to go through the part of the discussion, but let's sneak a peek ahead to the last part of Romans 8. When he, when he has said many things, some of, some of which we're going to look at, and he says this in verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Well, the answer is they were charging each other with all kinds of shortcomings. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? That's, that's a rhetorical question. It's asking, how, having said all this, if we're, if we're not condemned, if we're in Christ Jesus, if we're saved by grace through faith, how dare we condemn each other? There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Since God condemns none of us, the, Ro the Roman Christians were, were being taught in this letter to get out of the business of condemning one another. Why? Now, give me your ears. And this is Romans 8. Because if we are to be children of God, we have the same Father, we must have the same attitude toward, attitude toward one another that God has toward us all. Now, this phrase in our, in our text, as we focus in upon it, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. In my uh, translation of the New Testament, it, the Spirit of God is capitalized. Now, it probably is in yours. It should not be. The word spirit in the uh, New Testament, or in the whole Bible, as a matter of fact, is used uh, almost exactly the way we use the word spirit. Now, the word spirit, as many words do, as most words do, by the way, most common words, it has many shades of meaning or different meanings, and we have to look to the context to tell what it means. In English and in the Greek, Sometimes the Spirit means the Spirit of God. In that case, it should be capitalized. Sometimes it means the Spirit of man. Sometimes it means uh, breath. Sometimes it means an idea or a virtue. For instance, the Spirit of joy, the Spirit of faith. Sometimes it means an attitude. And we say that, a man has a good spirit. Now, it's used in all those ways and others. And we determine whether it, what it means by the context, to repeat myself. You also know, and just let me remind you, that in the original manuscripts, there, were, there was no distinction between capital letters and small letters. It was all written in what we call capital letters, the unsealed manuscripts. The Greek text with the, what are called the minuscules, with, written in small letters, came centuries later. So that... When you read a capitalization, when, when your copy of the scriptures has a capital S, that is not a translation, that is an interpretation. You understand? There was no capital letter to translate in the original language. Now, uh, the, all the, uh, the, uh, the uh, vast majority of the translators of every major translation are Calvinist. Calvin has been called the theologian of the Holy Spirit. And Calvinist, Calvinistic uh, Bible translators, they operate from the theological proposition that God is, God's spirit does everything that's good and worthwhile, and man's spirit does nothing. And therefore, they go through the scriptures, and, and they write their Calvinism in, in many ways. One of the ways they do it is that they capitalize the word spirit wherever possible, unless it's just absurd to do it. And they are guided, now hear me, guided by their theology, not by the context. 
which means said all that so I can say this. We are not to be intimidated by capital S's when it's attached to the word spirit. We look at the context to see whether it means spirit of God or spirit in some other sense. It is my opinion, opinion, that you cannot take any major translation, including the New American Standard, which I use in the pulpit, and, and, and take all that capitalization at face value and come to a, a truly accurate understanding of the biblical doctrine of the Holy Spirit. That's my opinion. Well, that didn't cost you anything. But, uh, you, you invite a professor and you get in, you put yourself in for this kind of thing. Now, the word the Spirit of God is mentioned in this text, but here it does not mean that. Here, verse 14, it means spirit in the sense of attitude. Now, when he says those who have the attitude of God, these are sons of God. Now, keep in mind all the things I've taught you so far because I'm going to tie them together. I haven't forgotten what he's saying is, those who have the attitude of God, these are the sons of God. And you recall what I told you Friday night. In the ancient world, this is built upon the ancient oriental concept of sonship. You see, we think of sonship this way. This sonship is primarily of the flesh, secondarily of the spirit. I have a child, he's my son because, or my daughter, or my offspring because they're of my body. I would hope that they would have my mind, my spirit, my values, my attitudes. But if they don't, they're still my children. The ancients reversed this. The ancients thought this way, that any, anybody can have offspring. Plants and animals do that. But sonship, true sonship, full sonship, real sonship, resides in sonship of the spirit, not of the flesh. And we're going to, this is important. We're going to come back to this as we look at this text. But it, it was, it was uh, a common thing for a man in the ancient world to have a slave or, a, or, uh, there would be, or another member of his household who might not be a slave who would be a servant who would have his spirit and a son who would not have his spirit. He would, he would throw his son out, his son of the flesh out, and adopt the, the slave as, as a son because true, shun, tr true sonship resides in the spirit. Now, and... To repeat the way I put it Friday night, I think I did. The ancients thought this way, you are the son of what you are like. Or you are the son of who you are like. It doesn't matter who your earthly father is. Now, let me give you an example. Let me expand. Turn to Matthew 5, 43 and 45. And we'll see a couple of examples of this. And I want to focus on this now because it's so important to understanding this text. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Look at verse 45. In order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You got that? You've heard it been said, uh, hate your enemies. I say, love your enemies. Why? God loves his enemies. And, you must, and if you're going to be sons of God, you must be like God and love your enemies. Very simple. Turn over to John 8. We find an, an expanded discussion based upon this concept that I'm pointing out to you. In John 8, uh, Jesus is having a debate with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and that outfit. And they are trying to kill him. Uh, verse 33, they answered him, we are Abraham's offspring. We've never been enslaved to anyone. Go on down to verse 37. Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's offspring, yet that is in the flesh. Yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. You got that? I'm obeying my father and you're trying to kill me. And you're, that means you're obeying your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham's our father. Jesus said to them, if you're Abraham's father, what? Do the deeds of Abraham. You're the son of who you're like. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. How can you say you're sons of Abraham? Abraham wouldn't be trying to kill me. You are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you'd love me. <laughs> well, you can't hate me and be a child of God. Why? You can't, you're, you're the son of who you're like. God loves me. That's very clear, isn't it? It takes professional help to miss that. 
Down to verse 44. You are of your father the devil. That's who your daddy is. Why? You want to do the desires of your father. You got that? And what, what does the devil want? He wants to kill me. What do you want? You want to kill me. That makes the devil your father. Now, we could go on from there. Uh, but you, I think we've, we've established that point. Now, here's what he's saying. You see, when he said those who are, those who have the attitude of God, these are sons of God, he, they knew exactly what he meant. Now, let me see where we're going here. <clears throat> First of all, well, let me tie it together, make sure we don't lose anybody along the way. Romans 8 is about the fact that the Jewish Christians and the, and the Gentile Christians must accept each other in the church at Rome. They must quit condemning each other because God has forgiven all of them in Christ. There is no condemnation from God. Therefore, they must have the attitude of their God, of their Father, if toward each other that he has toward them all. Now, why am I teaching on this tonight? About time I told you, isn't it? Let me tell you, there are few things more important than attitude, a man's spirit. If I have to choose between a leader who is theologically sound, but who has a bad spirit, and you know what I mean by that, and a leader who has a lot to learn, but has a good spirit, I'll take the second man every time. He's teachable. A man with a bad spirit divides, and that was what was going on in the church at Rome. A man with a good spirit brings people together and builds them up. It's like a kid. I'll tell you, I've raised four, four kids, pretty much, pretty much done. And, I, and I, I know something about raising kids, and I'll tell you this. As long as the kid's got a good attitude, you can work with them. But once that attitude goes sour, you're in for hard times. And a church, is the fa which is the family of God, can do much with a good spirit. God can use a good spirit, the right spirit. But brother, a church can be as orthodox as Paul and be poor, small, mean-spirited. And God, I think, goes somewhere else to look for somebody to use. Verse 15, a spirit, there's that word. Now, note that that's small. That's a small letter uh, in your translation, is it not? Spirit of slavery. But you have received the spirit of adoption. Now, some of you may have a, my, mine has a small s. Yours may have a capital S, shows the confusion. It should also be a small s. As uh, sons, we, which, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, here's what he's saying. If we're going to be like God, or be the sons of God, we must be like God. And we are sons. We have not received the spirit of slavery. And that's the question I would raise tonight. Are we slaves or are we sons? <clears throat> the spirit of slavery. You have not received the spirit of slavery. Let's talk about that a second. The spirit of slavery. That is, you're like a slave. We're not to be like slaves. Now, what's he getting at? Now, this was very important to the Christians at Rome. I won't go into the, to the historical background of what I'm about to say, but uh, since I teach uh, ancient history, you can trust me. <laughs> uh, it's very likely over half of the people who first heard this letter, the Christians at Rome, either were slaves or had been slaves or their parents had been slaves. They were called freedmen. I want you to know that this letter was written by, that is penned by, it was dictated by Paul, he's the author, but it was written by a slave. How do I know that? We'll flip back to Romans 16, and I'll, te I'll teach you. Romans 16, verse 22. What does it say? I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. I thought Paul wrote the letter. No, Paul did not pen his own letters, and you know why, don't you? Probably as a reminder of his Damascus Road experience, Paul had bad eyesight. He did not see well enough to write his own letters. Now, what he would do, often he would sign them. For instance, to the Galatians, he, he says, see what large letters I write. This is really from me. And as a man that could not see, he would write very large. And so Paul dictated his letters to an, what is called an amanuensis. We might call it a secretary. And then he allowed the secretary, usually to give his own, who was a Christian, to give his own greeting. And so he says to Tertius, who's writing this, 
Give your word, a personal word. So Tertius is glad to do it. I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Now, how do I know he's a slave? Look at his name, Tertius. You know what that means? Three. And look down at the next verse. Gaius, Paul continues, host to me. Now, Paul was writing this from Corinth in the house of, he was staying with a fellow called Gaius. Host to me and to the whole church. The church was meeting in his house. Greet you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And Quartus, the brother. Quartus. That's four. Three writes the letter. Four greets you. In Acts chapter 20, verse 4, we meet Secundus. That's two. We meet Septimus, who's seven, and Quintus, who's five. These are all slave names. You see, it's very common in the ancient world for a master not to give slaves personal names, just number them. One, two, three, four. How would you like to be called six? Why? You were the sixth slave bought in the house. You didn't have a name, you had a number, like, like a criminal. And three wrote this letter. Think how he felt when Paul says, we've not received the spirit of slavery. Now, but we have received the spirit of adoption as sons. As I said a few moments ago, <clears throat> slaves were often adopted if they had the spirit of the master. One of the words which is translated redemption is the word agorazo, which means to buy in the marketplace. To buy in the marketplace. What did you buy in the marketplace? Well, you bought beans in the marketplace, and you bought chickens in the marketplace, and you bought pottery in the marketplace, and you bought people in the marketplace. And people would go and buy slaves and take them home. And often these slaves would become more than slaves. They would be adopted, but, but often they did not. If, they, if many slaves did not ever become fully accepted as, as sons, most did not. And slaves in the first century were absolute property of their masters. Under Roman law, especially, and this was modified some by Augustus, but under traditional Roman law, it was modified very much. Uh, if you owned a slave, you could kill them without question. And a slave, therefore, who was nothing more than a slave, operated from the spirit of fear. What does our text say? You have not received the spirit of slavery again to fear. A slave does what he has to do because he's afraid not to. To, to translate this to the idiom of modern of, of American uh, 19th century slavery, they, they, would be, they were afraid that they would be sold down the river. Now a slave did what he had to do because he had to, and he was afraid not to. And hear me, Christians have no business with the spirit of fear. A lot of slaves in the church, they're, they're a part of the household. They're not lost. They've been redeemed. They've been bought in the marketplace. But they've been slaves and nothing more. Serving Christ out of fear. Now, the, the, the threat of, of judgment is a biblical motive for the Christian life. Jesus used it. Peter used it. All the New Testament writers use it. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. While it is a biblical motive, and a, therefore a legitimate motive, it is not the primary motive. You see, God does not want us, want a group of, of, of in his household, he does not want nothing more than slaves who serve him out of fear. God does not want our primary motive to be fear of what he's about to do. He wants our primary motive to be love for what he's already done. It is not the second coming that is our primary motive, it is the cross. It is not judgment, it is grace which motivates us. It is not the fear of God that is our primary motive, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, Romans 2. But many Christians are still slaves, that and nothing else. Why, why are they in church? I've met them, I've done business with them. They're in church simply because the alternative is hell. And they don't make very good in church members. Because fear is a poor motive if that's the only motive. Well, I guess I better go to church. If I don't, I'm in trouble with God. Don't like it. And look what he's saying. Now, we're going we're to tie this into the context here. But you see, he is saying, hear me, he is saying to the Roman Christians that they must 
not simply tolerate each other out of fear. They must love each other as brothers. Slavery. But you have received the spirit of adoption. Often this man who was bought in the marketplace would be taken home and he would, in effect, become a son because he would adopt the spirit of the master. He would do what the master said, not because he was afraid not to, but because he loved the master and agreed with the master because he had the spirit of the master. He, in effect, became a son of the master because you're the son of who you're like. And many slaves, we have a record, for example, I'm, I'm thinking of Suetonius, the ancient historian who tells about the time when Tiberius was carrying on his terrible purges of the Roman nobility. And on more than one occasion, when the soldiers showed up at the front door to take the master of the house away to a, a kangaroo court and a quick death, that a slave, now a slave, a piece of chattel, property, would put on the master's ring on his hand and put the master's robe and sit at the master's seat and wait for the soldiers to come and take them away to a quick death while the master escaped out the back door. That does not sound like a slave, does it? That sounds like a son. And we have many records of men who adopted slaves because they had in effect become sons. And he says what he says, we have not received the slavery, the spirit of slavery again, going backwards to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Now that word Abba does not mean daddy. <clears throat> it, is a, it, is the, it is the family name, but uh, there, there was in the Arabic, Aramaic word Abba, there was a, a content of awe and respect that does not exist most of the time in the American word daddy. But even having said that, it was the family title. A son called his father Abba. You understand? Father is, he's not, he's not, because he's a son. Now, what is the difference between a son and a slave? Is the difference that a slave obeys and a son doesn't have to? Oh, no. Oh, no. Question, who obeys more and better, the slave or the son? Well, if the son has the spirit of the master and then becomes a son and has the spirit of his adoptive father, he is going to obey better than the slave, not less. Now, let me illustrate it this way. I... Uh, I taught a family seminar, and you know my theories on raising children, and we start with the basic proposition, I'm daddy and you're not. And my children are under my authority they, because I have the responsibility for them. They have to do what I say, just like they were slaves. I mean, I don't own them legally, <laughs> but they're mine, and they know it. And you know, over the years when I would take a trip like this, when I would walk in the front door, and there's my children. They would all throw themselves on their face at my feet and say, Welcome home, Master. <laughs> no, they didn't. No, no. They grabbed my leg and slobbered all over my pants and said, Hi, Daddy. They cried out, Abba, Father. Does that mean they didn't have to obey me? No, it just simply meant their sons. The difference is not obedience. The difference is attitude. And that's what this text is about. Those who have the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. They're like, they're, they have the attitude of the Father. And in particular, the attitude of no condemnation. The difference between us, it's attitude. You got that? Attitude, attitude, spirit. The difference, and let me just make it simple this way. The difference between a slave and a son is the difference between got to and get to. Slaves got to, sons get to. They do the same thing. Now, some things in life are got-tos, and some things are get-tos, and we know the difference. <laughs> My wife doesn't do windows. I didn't know that when I married her. She, she, she does them on the inside, but she doesn't do them on the outside. I didn't know that. And I, do the, I, I got to do the windows. <laughs> I, I got to do Linda's windows. <laughs> now, I don't, now, I don't mind doing that. She does a lot of other things great, and so I do the windows. <laughs> And uh, I got to do Linda's windows. And I got a kiss or two. She likes to be kissed. And she just was not happy unless I kiss her or something. So every day or two, I kiss her. 
Why? Well, fellas got to, right? Got to do that. Oh, no. No, you ever seen my wife? Man, kissing her is a get-to thing. I mean, it's stand back, give me room, and let somebody do this that knows how. Huck her up, baby. Here I come. You're in for a treat. Why? I'm telling you, I'm, I kiss Linda, and I'm good at it. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm not good at many things, but I'm good at that. You see, I got to do Linda's windows, but I get to kiss her. <laughs> now, some things are got to's, and some things are get to's. And hear me, kingdom business is get to business. It's son business, not slave business. Not slaves who got to out of fear but sons who get to out of love. Now, as this applies, you got that? And as it applies here, you have harmony. You see, slaves, and, and their ancient records are full of accounts of this, slaves bickered and fought and tolerated each other and refrained from killing each other and stealing from each other only because they had to. You got that? Slaves take each other apart. Slaves compete. Slaves lie about one another. Slaves criticized one another. Slaves barely tolerated the other slaves. Just like the Jewish Christians and the, Rome, and the Gentile Christians were treating each other in the church at Rome. But Paul says, through the, speaking the words of Jesus, divinely inspired, there is no condemnation if we're children of God. And, and we are to be toward one another sons. We are not to tolerate one another. We are to, in Christ, accept one another. And you have a church that is a bunch of slaves. They'll treat each other like fellow slaves. And they'll take each other apart. And that church will never amount to a hill of beans. Let me tell you, the work of the kingdom requires sonship. Sons. Who are servants, yes, but more than servants, adopted, therefore sons. You know, I think I see this. I, I like being here. I'm not trying to puff anybody up. I'm, I don't do that. I don't have to. I, you can't fire me. <laughs> but I think this is the church of sons. I think you really take care of each other, don't you? You don't just tolerate each other. Once in a while a slave shows up, but you can change that person most of the time. Sons. We've got a rule at our house. I, I don't I got a family of sons and daughters. We've got a rule at our house. We never let our kids bite each other. We allowed one bite per life. <laughs> My wife always bit harder and stopped that. Never allowed our children to hit each other. We got one swing per life and then the the wrath set in. We never, and when the kids get to bickering, all kids bicker a little bit, but we, but we never allow it to become harsh and destructive. I can tell you the times I've lined my kids up, four of them, and ask each one in order, what's your last name? And make them tell me. And when the last one is repeated, the last, the family name, I say, did you notice anything? We all got the same last name. You know what that means, kids? And they're, and they're being very obedient because they're afraid. <laughs> you know what that means? Yes, Daddy. It means the reason you've got the same last name is your brothers and sisters. You belong to the same family and you belong to me. And in my house, brothers and sisters are a part of the family. And in this family, we take care of each other. And we stand up for each other. And we defend each other. And we don't hate each other. And you notice we all got the same name? We're all sons. We're all Christians. And there's no condemnation if we're in Christ Jesus. That's lovely, isn't it? One more thing to say, then I'm going to finish. <clears throat> the Spirit bears witness with our, with our spirit that we are children of God. If children heirs, also and heirs of God. Why did he put that in? If children heirs. You see, under Roman law, a slave, although he might be in fact, in all, for all practical purposes, this person might be a son. And you know what that means. He could not, he could not adopt, I'm sorry, he could not inherit unless he were adopted. You get that? 
I, saw, I read one account where a man, a slave, was adopted, and the slave was 65 years old. He had served the master faithfully, had been a son, really, but he couldn't inherit. And so, in order that he might inherit, he adopted him. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. We're heirs because we've been adopted. We get to inherit. You got that? We get to inherit. We're sons. <clears throat> this church, like the church I serve, has a great has a great future. <laughs> We've got a joke at our church. I won't tell you the background of it. I, I told in the, pul in the, in the pulpit two minutes, uh, several weeks ago about a, news, a, a sports caster was interviewing a coach. And the coach made this brilliant statement. He said uh, to the interviewer, I believe our future is ahead of us. I said, I certainly hope so, or Einstein was wrong. <laughs> our future is ahead of us. Now, what he meant was good things are ahead of us, but I, that's where our future is, you know, is ahead of us. And I kid the church and my students about uh, eating the spiritual value of oatmeal. I'm a great believer in oatmeal. So we've adopted the saying at our church, if we trust God and eat our oatmeal, the future is ahead of us. <laughs> well, I believe your future is ahead of you. There's going to be great things done here, but hear me, slaves aren't going to get it done. It's going to take sons. That's as clear as I know how to make it. The household of God, the Church of Christ at Treaty, is going to prosper because of sonship. No slavery here. And if you're not a Christian, wouldn't you like to be a part of this church family? Wouldn't you like to inherit? Come, then be adopted. The adoption papers are right here. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. If you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, be added to the church. That's the family of God, your son. Welcome to the family. Won't you come while we stand and while we sing?